Our next speaker is Dr. Kristen Glorioso. In addition to being founder and executive director of Longevity Global, Dr. Kristen Glorioso is the co-founder and CEO of NeuroAge Therapeutics. She is a pioneer of the first aging clocks in humans with seminal publications dating back to 2005. Dr. Glorioso is an expert in AI and predictive modeling and built the number one US COVID case prediction model out of 104 teams worldwide in the XPRIZE Pandemic Response Challenge, which had a lower error, lower error rate than the best US CDC models. Previously, she was head of AI of the COVID-B initiative at the Stanford spinoff, teach aides and chief strategist of UCSF's Baker Aging Research Institute. She has been awarded fellowships by AFAR, the Glenn Foundation for Medical Research, and the National Institute on Aging. Dr. Glorioso holds an MD and PhD in neuroscience from the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon University's Medical Sciences Training Program and completed her postdoctoral training at MIT. Let's welcome Dr. Glorioso. Thanks a lot. Um, so happy to talk about my other hat. Um, so uh, as mentioned, I'm co-founder and CEO of NeuroAge Therapeutics, and we are a longevity biotech company that's creating drugs to uh, reverse brain aging in order to treat dementia. And I'm going to give you a our view of uh, what is causing dementia and other age-related neurodisorders, which is pretty different from views that have been given standardly for the last 20 years. So I believe that brain aging is a program that leads to neurodegenerative diseases that we can reprogram using drugs. Um, and before I tell you about how, how we plan to do that, uh, I want to tell you why, why I'm doing this. So these are my grandparents. And so when I was a little kid, um, my grandmother suffered with Alzheimer's, and my grandfather took care of her in the home. And this had a very big impact on me as a kid, led me to dedicate my life to coming up with better therapies for Alzheimer's disease. And now, unfortunately, um, it's in the next generation. My aunt is currently suffering. Um, this is a, a, a very common story. So there are more than 35 million people in the US that have an age-related neurodegenerative condition, including Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and related dementias. Um, so uh, a little bit of background on what these diseases are. So there's a very simple problem in most neurodegenerative diseases, which is death of neurons. And depending on where those neurons die, uh, that's the disease that you end up with. So if the neurons die in the hippocampus, that's Alzheimer's. If they occur in frontotemporal lobes, that's frontotemporal dementia. Um, in the spinal cord, that's ALS. Um, so the big question has been, why do the neurons die? And this is really important in order to design therapies to prevent those cells from dying. So uh, there's been a hypothesis, at least in Alzheimer's disease, for the last uh, 25 years called the amyloid hypothesis. It's focused on toxic buildup of proteins in or around neurons. Um, and this is very controversial. So whether or not this is the cause of neuron death is still unclear. Uh, it's definitely not the entire picture. Um, there's been uh, publications that have been retracted. There's counter evidence. So there's people that are walking around with brains full of these toxic proteins that have completely normal memories. So that kind of goes against what you would think of of something that's causal, uh, counter evidence. Um, and so for the last 25 years, there's been billions and billions of dollars spent on clinical trials that have all been aimed at one thing, which is removing these proteins, with the idea that if you get rid of the proteins, then you can uh, cure dementia, and um, that will uh, end up treating Alzheimer's disease. So there's been a couple of success stories just this year that have followed 
uh, decades of failure. So there's been uh, two approved drugs that have taken this strategy. So they're antibodies, they remove these amyloid plaques. The drugs work a little bit. They have been approved by the FDA. Um, they don't work for everyone. They work better very earlier on in the disease, and they have bad side effects. So 20% of people will have brain swelling and bleeding. And so patients are now really struggling with whether these drugs are worth taking. So I believe that removing amyloid is like trying to protect the trees in a forest fire by sweeping up the ashes afterwards. It's not going to bring back the trees. And we need a preventative strategy that prevents neuron death in the first place. So we know that brain aging is the largest dementia risk factor. There's an exponential increase in risk. Um, you may even think of it as inevitable or part of the aging process, given that by the time we're 95, 50-50 chance of having Alzheimer's disease, which are just huge odds. Um, and I think a lot of us will be facing that with people living longer and better therapies for other diseases. Um, so what is happening during brain aging that uh, may be causing this? So a few things about brain aging. So some forms of cognition are relatively stable uh, throughout your life. So uh, wisdom, so occupational and world knowledge remains relatively flat or unchanged, but other forms of cognition change steadily, even starting in your 20s. So working in long-term memory and processing speed. But importantly, people have different rates of this change. And some people don't decline hardly at all. So these are just uh, longitudinal graphs of people at two different time points. And each graph is a different uh, uh, aspect of cognition. So if you look at word retention, for instance, some people measured at two different time points have a completely flat line. So they don't lose this ability at all measured over decades. But some people have this relatively steep decline. And the reason this is important is it offers some hope that not everyone is having this uh, age difference. And the other thing that happens during brain aging is that brains actually shrink. This also starts in your 20s. So this is an average of MRI gray matter volume over time. And you can see on average people's brains are shrinking. That, again, is variable. So some people have large amount of loss. Some people have hardly any loss. Underlying that are what's happening within cells. So at least during normal aging, uh, neurons aren't dying uh, for the most part. Instead, the shrinkage is due to loss of dendritic processes and synapses. And underlying, so and there's other hallmarks of aging. And I should say that these hallmarks um, in the brain are uh, specific, they're, they're different. So uh, yesterday, Steve Horvath was talking about splitters versus lumpers. This is a little bit of a splitters view, which is that there are some very specific hallmarks that are occurring within brain cells that you may not see otherwise because you, for the most part, have the same neurons you've had your entire life. So mechanisms like telomeres and senescence are less important. Instead, you see mitochondrial dysfunction, losses of dendrites, changes in neurotransmitter signaling, and then in glia, you have this glial uh, dystrophic phenotype. And their gene expression changes that happen with age mirror these hallmarks. So about 10% of the genome changes with age in human prefrontal cortex. Um, so uh, you have cells, inside the cells you have your nucleus, you have DNA, the DNA is uh, transcribed into RNA, which is uh, translated into protein, and those mRNA levels change with age. So here's a couple of examples. I think they're very striking. These are not subtle changes, and they again, like, like cognition, like changes in gray matter volume, are uh, starting in your 20s, so this continuous process. So these are two disease-related genes. You see that uh, uh, from age uh, 20 all the way up to age 80, you have these uh, decrease in this gene helpinin. These are both Alzheimer's-related genes, and it's pushing in the direction that would be predicted to cause a disease. 
And so the question is, can you take these levels that are disease-causing and turn them back to levels that are uh, happening in your 20s? And how would you do that? Um, so you can take all of these, turn it into a clock. This is a transcriptome clock in human brain. Um, and what we showed in large longitudinal cohorts of older adults that were followed before they uh, died and then uh, donated their bodies to science, that uh, people that are just five years younger in this transcriptome clock are six times less likely to have dementia. Um, they're also less likely to have uh, preclinical Parkinson's signs, and they're in subjects without any disease at all. They have uh, slower changes in their uh, rate of cognitive decline. Um, and for purists, uh, delta age in human brain also predicts overall lifespan, if that's your bottom line. Um, and that only happens in people older than 60, which makes sense because um, people under 60 are not dying from neurodegenerative disorders for the most part. OK, so some people these people that have slower brain aging, these are the people that are 95 years old, they're sharp as a tack, um, have uh, genes that is related to um, how fast their brains are aging. And we can determine which genes are controlling the rate of their brain aging using causal inference and Mendelian randomization. And so what NeuroAge does is creates drugs that target these proteins, we're calling them BOS proteins, um, they, uh, that then uh, can reverse uh, the program of brain aging uh, at a tra transcriptome level. And if Yamanaka factors are the CEOs of, of the cell, these are more like middle management. So they're not necessarily transcription factors, but they do regulate gene expression. So NeuroAge has two products. Uh, our first product is a test that can tell you um, how old your brain is and uh, your likelihood of having dementia more than 30 years ahead of time. Um, and this test also is continuously feeding data into our uh, personalized therapeutics. Um, so this is Max. Max is 55. He has a brain age of 51. So he's 41% less likely to uh, have dementia, and that's pushed for, further out. So currently, we can recommend to Max to uh, improve his lifestyle um, and come back and get retested. And then coming soon are uh, NeuroAge's personalized therapeutics for uh, people that aren't able to achieve uh, low risk of dementia with lifestyle interventions alone. And so the NeuroAge test is pretty comprehensive. It has a blood test for RNA-seq levels, genetics, epigenetics. There's a brain MRI, and there's also cognitive testing. And we put that all together into a super predictor using AI, and we can tell you how old your brain is. Um, and then just a little bit more about our drugs targets. So um, we're pretty excited about these. Um, these are the BOS proteins that we're targeting. Uh, many of them already have evidence in mice, are linked to neurodegenerative diseases. They're in logical pathways. Some of my, there's uh, an overrepresentation of mitochondria, so I'm a big believer that mitochondria are driving a lot of this. Um, many of them also have links to neurodegenerative diseases, and in some cases, we can move quickly because they're repurposable or modifiable drugs that exist for them. Um, this is my team, so I'm Kristen. I uh, couldn't do this without my co-founder, Priyanka Joshi, uh, who's my C CSO. Um, she is training from Cambridge and also from Berkeley, and uh, was uh, Forbes 30 Under 30, and on the cover of Vogue magazine as one of the most influential women in Britain for her work. And we just added uh, David Doswell, who's been helping us with um, many of the website and cognitive games that we're rolling out. Um, I have an expert advisory board, including uh, Ranjan Nag, and um, many of you know Matt Caberlin, and uh, Salah Mahmoudi, um, who has deep pharma expertise. 
Uh, we're currently raising a seed round. We've raised money from MIT Angels, from R42 Group, from Black Mountain Ventures, uh, and uh, are currently in Berkeley Skydeck. And if you want to play neuro games, we have a beta up on our website. So you can do the cognitive testing portion of the test that we're rolling out. And happy to take questions. Hello, uh, great talk. I'm here. <laughs> so um, uh, when you started the presentation, you're talking about Alzheimer's and um, so will these therapeutics be um, effective for treating Alzheimer's or they are mostly geared towards dementia? Because I, the last time I was reading that there was no direct correlation between aging and Alzheimer's or there is a very, um, um, it, it, th there's no perfect correlation between aging and Alzheimer's. Yeah, so Alzheimer's is, is one form of dementia. So dementia is the umbrella term. So there's like Alzheimer's dementia, Parkinson's dementia, frontotemporal dementia. Um, and the incidence of all of those increased dramatically with age. We think these drugs are going to work better in people with uh, milder forms mm -hmm. of dementia before mm -hmm. things have progressed too far okay. um, and protect the neurons that exist. And will these drugs help to reduce the NFTs and uh, plaques still or they will target some other markers of Alzheimer's? Yeah, so that's the interesting thing. When we, we looked at the relationship between plaques uh, and tangles and uh, biological brain age using this clock, and um, the relationship was there, but it was weak. So APOE was much more related to that. Mm -hmm. And so we think this is a separate set of pathways that are contributing to dementia from, from these plats and tables. Thank you. Thank you for a great talk. Um, my question is, if you want to sign up to take the NeuroAge test, do you just go online and get on the wait list? Yes. OK, and how long do you think that wait list will be? So we're, we're, try <laughs> we're, we're have an ambitious goal of rolling this out next spring. So, okay. But you can play the, the neuro games now. And we're going to have a pilot that's free, so like a free version for yeah. anyone that wants to guinea pig themselves in the next coming months. Okay, thank you. Great talk. Um, we're yeah. um, great <laughs> talk. So uh, I'm wondering about peripheral markers um, of uh, biomarkers of being able to detect this and, and correlation to then human brain. Because mm -hmm. human brain is really hard to get. And then, of course, if you're wanting to test this in living subjects, you're not going to have access to that. But peripheral would be great. Yeah, so for many years I studied postmortem human brain, and the big drawback is, of course, that people have to die for you to get access to that sample. Um, <laughs> uh, but some of these cohorts do have both brain and blood, and so what we were able to do is to predict the brain clocks from the blood uh, RNA-seq. So that enabled us to have a blood test for the brain clocks. That's different than an overall biological aging test. Thanks. Yeah. I've been starting to think about the correlation between performance enhancing um, interventions and aging. And I'm wondering with the age clock in particular, have you looked at any, you know, amphetamines or whatever that you know, can boost performance in some short terms, whether those have long term effect on brain age? Yeah. So. We haven't yet, but we would love to do that. So with our diagnostic, we're going to start asking people surveys about what they're doing um, to start collecting data in that vein. We have, in the postmortem cohorts, we have some like general medical records. We know like prescription drugs people are taking, but we don't have that kind of granularity at this point. But that's a major goal of this, is to see what lifestyle changes or even what drugs people are taking that affect the clocks. Well, um, coffee break, and then we're going to have a pitch contest. <laughs>